All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are locked on Falcons, and I'm your host, Aaron Freeman, and today is a mock draft Monday, where we'll be talking about the Falcons' potential to draft. Florida State pass rusher Jermaine Johnson will be answering some leftover listener questions, and you may hear me go on a rant about why drafting a wide receiver in round one this year is the worst idea I've ever heard. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So, guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at FalcFans.com, RIP, still going strong on Twitter, at FalcFans, and of course, the host of this illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, right here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And of course, today's episode of Locked On Falcons is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props odds, lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. And guys, I want to thank everyone that makes Locked On Falcons their first listen. Of course, Locked On Falcons, just like all the Locked On Podcast Network shows, as well as the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family of shows is free and available Monday through Friday, every single day on your preferred podcast platform, including Apple, Odyssey, Google, Spotify, and of course on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the Locked On Falcons YouTube channel and you'll get the episode, the video version of the episode the night before the audio version of the podcast drops. So guys, today is another Mock Draft Monday. And as you guys well know, we've been doing these since the end of the season, uh, you know, the regular, the postseason for the NFL. Obviously, the Falcon season ended much earlier than the rest of the NFL season did. Uh, but it's basically since mid February, this is now, I think, mock draft Monday number nine. And each time we look at a different mock draft so that I can basically spend, you know, 10 to 20 minutes talking about a player. Uh, and giving you my thoughts on a player in today's episode, we're going to be talking about Florida State edge rusher Jermaine Johnson, looking at a mock draft uh, that had him. I think we're Peter Schrager. It didn't. It doesn't really matter what the mock draft is. It's just an excuse to talk about the player. Then later in the episode, there are some leftover mailbag questions from last week's mailbag episode, which I believe was Thursday, and one of them pertains to the um, Falcons drafting. Um, what they should be focusing on in their draft. And that will allow me to go on a big rant about pass rushers. And we'll talk about Kayvon Thibodeau and whether or not there's some boom bust to him as well. So without further ado, let's jump into uh, the Jermaine Johnson conversation. And those of you that aren't familiar with Jermaine Johnson, uh, he's at Florida State this past year, but that was after two seasons at Georgia. That was after two seasons as a JUCO transfer um, that basically I think he had to go to community college because of his grades weren't great. He was a backup at Georgia for a couple of seasons, was productive off the bench, but didn't get a ton of playing time. And then this past year at Florida State was really his first opportunity to get a significant amount of playing time. And he was very productive uh, with 11 and a half sacks and 17, I believe, and a half tackles for losses. Um, Johnson is a power rusher. That's his primary mode of production, uh, using that bull rush, using stab moves, all these various things. He does have a decent array of moves. You'll see a spin move. You'll see a swipe. You'll see some chop stuff. Um, but he isn't necessarily as polished as a true speed attack the outside shoulder, bend the edge type of pass rusher. You'll see some plays like that. But one of the reasons why I was not particularly high on him when I watched him initially at the end of the season was because of that lacking sort of that traditional, you know, just bend the edge speed rushes, which is usually where the high level pass rushers get the predominant uh, amount of their production in the NFL. Uh, and I wonder if some of that is owed to not necessarily having the footwork and the the polish there uh, in, in that regard. Um, the other thing that stood out to me about Johnson is he does have a seemingly high number of cleanup sacks when it comes to his production. His pass rush win rate, according to Pro Football Focus, his past year was on the low end. It was about 14%. I think Trayvon Walker is really the only high-end uh, edge rusher that's expected to go particularly high in this draft that has a pass rush win rate lower than that. Um, and typically what you're seeing for most first-round edges is in the 20s in terms of the percent of pass rush win rate. Uh, so that is a concern for you. And you sort of 
sort of speaks to maybe a lot of his production comes in terms of cleanup sacks. You look at his 11 and a half sacks this past year, like five and a half of those, so roughly half his production, at least as far as sacks go, uh, came in two games against Jacksonville State where he dominated a, lo- a lower level of competition. And then in the Miami game where he had three sacks and he really dominated the right tackle in that game, um, but then had one of his sacks was a cleanup sack in that game. So you do have a little bit of concern that maybe Johnson may not necessarily be a high end pass rusher at the next level. I think he has the tools to get there, uh, particularly if he can learn, you know, improve his footwork and and be able to use the explosiveness that he does have as an athlete to maximize his speed rush and not necessarily rely on his power all the time as much. Um, but you do wonder like if he is more of a power rusher and he doesn't develop that speed, as we talked about, you know, several years ago when Tack McKinley was here, those guys tend to be a little bit more pressure guys than the true sack artists. So you do kind of wonder is, is Jermaine Johnson more of this sort of Brandon Graham type of player, Adrian Claiborne type of player, uh, Tack McKinley type of player that may only get, you know, six or seven, maybe eight sacks a year, but gets, you know, 40, 50 or more pressures. And whether or not that's sort of the go-to guy that you need on the edge and and he's more of a number two or number three guy, really, um, you know, in conjunction with Grady Jarrett. If Grady Jarrett's your number two guy, you need a a really sort of a go-to double-digit sack guy opposite Jermaine Johnson, and he's really more of a number three in that regard. And I think when we have the conversation about Jermaine Johnson, because of these concerns you have, I think you can describe him as a bit of a reach. I know personally, you know, and I haven't gone through his film with a fine tooth comb or anything to really give you a a firm grade. But my guess is that if he was the Falcons pick and I did do that after the draft, as I always always wait uh, to see who the Falcons pick before, you know, considering spending all that time that I need to do in order to sort of finalize these grades and whatnot. My guess is my grade on Jermaine Johnson is more of a mid to late first round sort of talent. Um, in terms of what I see of him. So in that sense, you're looking at pick eight as a potential reach. But I, I I do think considering that the Falcons need pass rush, it's such a need position that you're willing to reach on that. And I think Johnson, in comparison to some of these other guys, may be a little bit higher floor guy, even if his ceiling isn't as high as some of the other alternative options. The Falcons could use a top 10 pick, and, and it's such – a need that I think you just kind of have to, um, you know, you got to be willing to reach, even if you know that like this isn't going to be the guy that single handedly solves your problem like you typically want for a top 10 pick. But I don't know if there's really a guy in this draft class, you know, that really does that um, outside of maybe Aiden Hutchinson. And even then, he's probably not that guy. So, you know, that's where we'll leave the Jermaine Johnson conversation. We'll revisit, you know, more edge rushers like Kayvon Thibodeau at the end of the episode. But coming up, I do want to answer some listener question talking about what positions do the Falcons need to invest in. And that speaks to the Jermaine Johnson conversation. But that will give me an opportunity to go on a little bit of a rant over the idea, given that there have been recent rumors and reports that the Falcons are really interested in taking a wide receiver at that eighth number Uh, eighth overall uh, draft selection. And essentially what I will basically explain when I go on this mini rant as we continue today's episode is that that is the worst possible selection that the Falcons could possibly make with that eighth overall selection. I'll explain that as we continue today's Locked on Falcons podcast, guys. But before we get there, I do want to let you guys know about the Locked on Sports Atlanta YouTube and podcast channel and you get three different shows on that channel uh, that cover all of Atlanta sports not just the Falcons but the Braves the the Hawks uh, the Bulldogs everything local as well as national headlines you can get hitting hard with uh, John Chuckery A to Z with Mark Zeno and ATL day ones with Jarvis Davis and Tanitra Baptiste, and you know all those folks from their time at 680 The Fan and 92.9 The Game. So check out Locked On Sports Atlanta on its own channel on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube. And guys, you know, speaking of, you know, Atlanta local coverage, why not um, head on over to Bet Online if you want to get in on the local uh, coverage of the uh, Atlanta Braves because, you know, baseball is back. And you can get in on that action at betonline.net, the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. You can also get podcasts, odds, contests, player props, 
everything you could possibly imagine at Bet Online. And it's not just baseball. Bet Online has you covered for NBA playoffs coming up. You got boxing, UFC, golf, the Masters just wrapping up, hockey playoffs coming up, esports, even your favorite Vegas casino games. And you know they got you covered for all the great 2022 NFL draft props as well. So head to the website today. Use your mobile device to sign up and learn more about the trends in the action. Bet online where the game starts. So we're continuing today's mock draft Monday episode. And, um, you know, we got a couple of listener questions that I want to answer. And one of them is adjacent to the conversation about the Falcons taking a potential wide receiver. We're talking about, you know, just finish wrapping up talking about reaches and why to me it's, it's at least somewhat justified for the Falcons to reach on an edge rusher at eight and it wouldn't be justified to reach on a, say a wide receiver. At eight. And, you know, as I say every week on mock draft Monday, you know, I shouldn't say this on mock draft Monday, but like, it's not about the mock drafts. Like we've been talking since February about the Falcons taking a wide receiver, or at least mock drafts have the Falcons taking a wide receiver. Right. And a listener asked me back in February when we were talking about like Drake London and Traylon Burks. And it was like, why are all these experts mocking wide receivers to the Falcons? And it was, look, it's a massive need, right? Everybody sat here and said, oh, the Falcons are the worst wide receiver group in the league. They didn't last year, right? The Jets, I mean, I mean, the Lions and the Saints had far worse wide receiver groups in the league, but they're getting Michael Thomas back. They're probably, the Saints are probably going to draft a wide receiver in round one and the Lions signed D.J. Chark. Meanwhile, the Falcons lost Calvin Ridley and Russell Gates. So now you can certainly say that the 2022 Falcons wide receiver room is the worst in the NFL. And so it is a massive need. There's no doubt about it. And when you look at the needs that this team has, wide receivers near the top of the list from a need standpoint in terms of what they have currently on the roster. This rant is not in reaction to all these mock drafts. This rant is in reaction to folks like Tony Pauline of Pro Football Network, Matt Miller of ESPN, saying that the buzz and the rumors that they're sitting here uh, hearing that the Falcons want to get a wide receiver. And I'm going to do the thing that I always chastise the rest of you guys for doing in reaction to mock drafts is I'm going to blow a gasket talking about a hypothetical, right? Again, not because of a mock draft, not because of a fake pretend draft, but because of various people that are plugged into the NFL are saying that they're hearing that the Falcons want a wide receiver. That's why I'm blowing a gasket because there's a lot, that's more meaningful to me than what some random dude on the internet or dude, dude or dudette on the internet mocks and pretends and, and projects to the Falcons in the draft. So I get it from the standpoint that the Falcons need a wide receiver, but I can't imagine this team taking a wide receiver in the first round because you just don't need it, right? And it gets to a, a question that KDX Trey X Pitts on Twitter asked, since the Falcons are pretty much building their roster from scratch, what positions would you like to see them emphasize in terms of dollars and draft capital over the next few years for this next version of the team? And I've talked about this already on the podcast the last couple of weeks. It's all about the trenches. You got to get better in the trenches. And like, for me, I cannot fathom a team like the Falcons drafting a wide receiver at eighth overall, investing that type of draft capital in a wide receiver when they don't have a quarterback, they don't have a running game, they don't have a, a competent offensive line, and they don't have a defense. Right. And we can look at a team like the Bengals last year with Jamar Chase and say, oh, well, you know, but the Bengals had a quarterback. They had a running game with Joe Mixon. And while their defense was terrible in 2020, no different than the Falcons defense this past year. You know what the Bengals did last offseason? They went out in free agency and signed Trey Hendrickson and Larry Ogunjobi and Mike Hilton and Chidobe Awuzie and Eli Apple and Ricardo Allen and so much more. And again, I'm sorry, no offense to Casey Hayward and Lorenzo Carter. I don't think those moves are moving the needle quite to the same degree that signing a 13 sack guy like Trey Hendrickson was for the Bengals a year ago to improve what was the league's worst pass rush in 2020. And so like, and then you, on top of that, when you look at Jamar Chase, Jamar Chase was arguably a generational wide receiver. He was arguably the best wide receiver prospect in a decade to come out last year. And so he was a dude. And again, while that pick was controversial at the time, do they take Penae Sewell? Do they take Jamar Chase? There was a polarizing debate on that decision. At least it was justifiable because Jamar Chase was that dude. There's no wide receiver in this draft. Now, maybe, maybe if, if Jamison Williams was healthy, we could have that conversation. And if Matt Ryan was still the quarterback here in Atlanta, guys, we could still have, we could justify taking a wide receiver because you're trying to help Matt Ryan. Now, again, you can have a conversation over whether or not that should be the priority for the Falcons to try to maximize Matt Ryan's year last year in a hypothetical situation where he's still the Falcons quarterback versus trying to build towards the future. 
But at least theoretically, if Jamison Williams was healthy, he was the he's the one wide receiver in this draft class that you could at least make the argument might be worthy of a top 10 pick because he has that one elite trait of being able to take the top off of defense. As much as I like the Garrett Wilsons and the Drake Londons and the Trey Burks, I think they're all good players. I think they're all first round picks, talents and whatnot. But none of these guys are top 10 picks. None of these guys on, on Jamar Chase levels. I mean, Jamison Williams is maybe, maybe a notch below like Henry Ruggs or Jalen Waddle or on a similar plane, you know, two guys that were high end guys, but there's no Jerry Judy in this draft class. I mean, you could argue that Rashad Bateman, who was like the 24th overall pick a year ago is better than some of these wide receivers that are being mocked in the top 10 to the Falcons or whatever the case may be. Like they're just not those guys. Like, you know, everybody wants to sit here and act like Garrett Wilson is Odell Beckham or Drake London is Mike Evans. And like, they're not those guys, man. Like they're good receivers, but they're not those guys. And so to answer this question, it's like you got to build in the trenches, man, like at least a quarterback. And you guys have heard me over the last two weeks say, I think reaching on a quarterback would be a bad pick for the Falcons. But at least that's a justifiable pick because it's a quarterback and you need a quarterback. You don't need a wide receiver because you're not winning games, throwing the ball 40 times a game. If Matt Ryan was a quarterback, yeah, we would have to throw the ball 40 times in order to win. And so you need a wide receiver to catch the football for Matt Ryan. But Marcus Mariota is not that dude, man. You know, you look at the NFL average last year in terms of passing attempts per game last year was like 34 and a half. So anything above 35 is an above average passing attack. Anything below 35 is below average in terms of the passing attempts. You look at Marcus Mariota's career mark in terms of when he's thrown the ball 35 or more times in a game, he's four and 12 as a starter. And when he's thrown at 34 or less, he's 25 and 20. This is not a guy, and again, this is not a knock on Marcus Mariota, but you're not building a pass-first attack with Marcus Mariota as a quarterback, let alone with one of these rookie quarterbacks, whether it's you know Malik Willis this year or uh, you know, CJ Stroud next year, or whatever the case may be, you're running the football guys. Like people, it's been so long since Matt Ryan was not Matt Ryan that people forget that those first two and a half years, he was a, on a run first team. The first time Matt Ryan threw the ball like 40 or more times and the Falcons won a game was that Thursday night game in year three against the Ravens. And then we didn't really do it again until 2012 when Dirk Cutter came in. Right. You know, and and then you look at Josh Allen, as incredible as Josh Allen was. You know, I sat here on talking with Charles McDonald last week saying, like, man, I think Josh Allen might be the best quarterback in the league. Right. But people forget that Josh Allen was terrible his first two years. The first time he went out and 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 threw the ball 40 times without throwing three picks in a game <laughs> was basically his third year. And you say, Oh, he got that, he did that because of you know, they added Stefan Diggs. Yeah, they added a like what a seven-year veteran all pro wide receiver. Go get your wide receiver after you get the quarterback you know what i'm saying like i sit here and say quarterback is a massive reach in this year's draft but it's justifiable because you need a quarterback you don't need a wide receiver unless your goal is to throw the ball 40 times a game you don't need a wide receiver right again i'm not sitting here saying don't draft any wide receivers but i'm sitting here saying like you're not the foundation of your rebuild is not based off of having Kyle Pitts as your wide receiver one and Drake London or Garrett Wilson as your wide receiver two. Like those guys are not going, they're not doing anything on this team. Run the football, build your offensive line. If you're going to reach on an offensive player at eight, it better be a quarterback, which again, I still wouldn't justify. I would say go and reach on Trevor Penning, take the Northern Iowa offensive tackle, be the team that takes a FCS player in the top 10 for the first time since I think like Steve McNair went in the top 10 or whatever the case may be. Reach on that guy because at least theoretically you can sit there and say, well, Trevor Penning is a prototypical right tackle in our scheme and he's going to help us do the thing that we're going to need to do for the next three years as we build up this roster, which is run the football. Right. If you're going to reach on a defensive player, take a pass rusher because this scheme is built off of winning with the front seven. Take guys that are different. Like Jordan Davis, Jermaine Johnson, take someone in the front. Seven. Heck, Devin Lloyd even makes sense as a middle linebacker, even though I'm not that high on Devin Lloyd. It's justifiable because your scheme is predicated because you're going to be playing with soft boxes all the time. So get some guys that can be difference makers in the, in the front seven, even in the secondary. I'm not as high on the idea of taking a secondary player because I sit here and say where your scheme is predicated on getting pressure with four guys. Again, I know everybody wants to sit here and pretend that Dean Pease is Wink Martindale, and he's not. He's Dean Pease, and Dean Pease's system is based off of pressuring with four guys, not throwing you know all these exotic blitzes at everybody like people want to believe. But 
even theoretically, you can sit there and say, okay, Kyle Hamilton, uh, Ahmad Gardner, or whatever the case may be, they're the best player available. They're difference makers in the secondary. And even if they don't necessarily fit the scheme, you can build, you know, you're going to need to accumulate defensive stars eventually and playmakers in the secondary. If you believe that those guys are, you know, if you believe, you know, Sauce Gardner is every bit the player that Jeff Akuda was supposed to be, but actually, you know, AJ Terrell in Jeff Akuda's body, right? And if you think Kyle Hamilton is a generational safety, then I don't, I'm not going to sit here and say that's a bad pick. Again, those are, are, are investments for your future. You need playmakers when the defense is eventually good, even if you need the front seven guys today. Eventually, you're going to need those playmakers in the secondary. So I'm not going to sit here and fret about that. But a wide receiver, man especially in this year's draft like they're like what are we talking about man this is the craziest thing i've ever heard in my life so if the falcons do it if you're sitting here being like aaron you're so negative on this regime and i'm like if they take a wide receiver guys you haven't seen anything yet this is the that would be the worst pick in the history of the world if the falcons without a quarterback without a run game without an offensive line without a defense take a wide receiver what is he doing to help you win football games nothing nothing not anything so i sit here and i go that would be crazy to me if the falcons were to take a wide receiver so i needed to go on that rant based off of the rumors i've seen various people be like yeah you know we could take a wide receiver like no if they take a wide receiver that's the worst pick in the world if if you thought i've been too harsh on this regime you haven't seen anything yet compared to what that episode friday morning after night one of the draft that they wind up reaching on a wide receiver in this draft you, you've only seen the tip of the iceberg in terms of my negativity that would be the worst pick i've ever seen the falcons make and it's not because those are bad players guys but it's just not going to help your football team run the football you're going to build around your young quarterback by running the football no quarterback comes into the league throwing the ball 40 times a game and winning games you're going to build the run game in a defense first, and then you can go get your weapons. Go get your Julio Jones after Matt Ryan's established three or four years in the league. Go get your Stephon Diggs after Josh Allen is established three or four years in the league. That's how it works, guys. Go get your Jamar Chase after you've established Joe Burrow in the league or whatever the case may be. Get a quarterback first and then go get a wide receiver. Run the football and then go get a wide receiver. Build your defense and then go get a wide receiver. Right When you can stop teams and then all of a sudden you can sit there and be like, oh, if we had an explosive playmaker, we can actually start winning some of these games where we're, you know, instead of losing these games 20 to 17, then you can go get a wide receiver and become the team that wins those games, you know, 27 to 20 or whatever the case may be. So end of rant. I will let it go at this point in time. But I just sit here and I go like, man, did they take a wide receiver? Oh, my God. That would be, oh, my. If you thought I've been negative – up to this point, man, that would be terrible. So we'll leave it at that. And we'll answer another listener question talking about sort of which one of these edge rushers has the most Vic beasley red flags on today's episode. And we'll talk about why Kayvon Thibodeau scares me a little bit in this draft class as that sort of guy that's maybe a little bit more of a boom bust. I'm a little nervous about if the Falcons take him. And we'll get into that as we continue today's Locked On Falcons episode, guys. But before we get there, I do want to plug the Locked On NFL and Locked On NFL Draft Podcast. If you want to get your daily fix for all the stories going on around the NFL, as well as all the things covering the NFL Draft, check out Locked On NFL. Check out the Locked On NFL Draft Podcast on your preferred podcast platform. So guys, I want to tell you about Built Bar, the protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar that's even better than a candy bar because Built Bars not only taste good, they're good for you. Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate, but they're low in sugar, calories, and carbs, but high in protein and fiber. And Built Bar has been all about the puff flavors these last few weeks. The puffs are the first protein-infused marshmallow, and they come in a variety of flavors like churro puff, banana cream pie, coconut marshmallow. You got the holiday flavor of yellow chirps, brownie batter puff. You can also get on sale flavors of regular flavors like caramel brownie and raspberry cheesecake. So get yourself a mixed box that includes the puffs as well as your tried and trues like salted caramel, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, etc. And you can find your favorite by heading over to built.com. And when you do use the promo code LOCK15 and you'll get 15% off your order, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. So our last question of the day comes from Ty French at Big French in. 83 
He says, uh, which of the first five-ish edge rushers in the draft are you wary of if drafted with the first two to three picks? Obviously, Atlanta has problems at this position in the past. So which one is the Vic Beasley? Um, and my interpretation of this tie is who's the guy that makes you nervous that if he drafts him, because I think with Vic Beasley, ultimately it boils down to me, part of the issue with Vic Beasley, let alone all the on-field stuff that involved Vic Beasley. We won't go too deeply into that. But I remember when we drafted Vic Beasley, the hype on Vic Beasley was so out of the norm that people hyped him up to be this Von Miller and John Abraham type of player. And I remember hearing all the hype about Vic Beasley and, and, and not being as high on him going into the draft, but like a lot of people loved Vic Beasley. And I was just kind of like, oh, okay, well, all these people know what they're talking about. And so once I sit down and watch the film, I will too fall in love with Vic Beasley. And I came away disappointed with that because I saw a player that had some major issues on the field. And again, I know a lot of the Vic Beasley narrative is like, oh, he didn't work hard off the field, but you know, people did not pay attention to a lot of the things that he did not bring on the football field that I think were also more instrumental in why he did not work out in the NFL and in Atlanta than uh, not, but we won't get into all of that. And I have similar concerns about Kayvon Thibodeau, not because I think Kayvon Thibodeau is a bad prospect, not because I don't think Kayvon Thibodeau it could be you know a, a star in this league, but like the hype on Kayvon Thibodeau, if he were to be the Falcons pick, and when you talk about these five-ish edge rushers, I'm talking about you know the guys that we sort of expect or see as first-round picks. Hutchinson, Trayvon Walker, uh, Thibodeau, Jermaine Johnson, George Karloftis, David Ojabo is probably going to be a, a second round pick uh, due to the injury. But when I look at these sort of premier edges, Thibodeau is the guy that scares me, not because I think he's a bad player, but just because the hype on him, similar to what we saw with Vic Beasley, the hype on Thibodeau is going to be that he is this sort of Von Miller, Khalil Mack, Jadavion Clowney, Miles Garrett level of prospect, and I don't think he's that guy. And we talked about this back in, I think, late February when we did a mock draft Monday about Kayvon Thibodeau before the combine or right after the combine. I can't remember when it was. Um, and we talked about kind of how where he's hyped to be this sort of generational first tier type of pass rusher. But in reality, he's more of a third tier guy, which I kind of defined as a guy that was uh, a top 10 pick in any draft class rather than a guy that's a number one pick or, or type of the guy. And like, that's the thing about Thibodeau is like the narrative around him is like, oh, he was this number one pick um, that is being unfairly maligned. We'll get into that a little bit later. But I remember Dane Brugler saying on a recent, I think the athletic podcast a couple of weeks ago, where he's like NFL team C um, Thibodeau more in that Vic Beasley tier pass rusher. And that sounds crazy to folks. And, you know, I know Falcon fans are swerving off the road as they listen to me or, you know, tripping on the treadmill at the gym or whatever the case may be hearing Thibodeau compared to, to Vic Beasley. Um, and I think he's a better prospect than that, but it is one of those things like Vic Beasley to me was like a fourth tier pass rusher, a guy that was a top 15 pick in any draft class. And when like, if, if miles Garrett is this truly generational player, right. And then Vic Beasley's here and that's the spectrum, right? Garrett Beasley. And the perception of Thibodeau is that he's on the Garrett side of things. But in reality, he's more here on the Beasley side of things. And so, like, that's where, like, I agree with Dane Brugler with what he said. He's, like, closer to Vic Beasley as far as a pass rusher um, than he is to, you know, these sort of generational guys. And part of the whole conversation with Kayvon Thibodeau and, and why, like, you have this narrative, oh, he was this number one pick. He, he was this guy. And the NFL is unfairly knocking him because of, character issues or attitude concerns or does he love football and it's like oh he's this world-class player that the nfl is for some reason knocking because they don't like his personality or something like that and so you have all these draft analysts coming out of the woodwork to defend cave on thibodeau and, and write about why he's this superstar pass rusher and i say i don't think that's really true and i think part of it is due to the fact that thibodeau was anointed early in his career the number one high school recruit went to Oregon, immediately was productive at like 10 sacks as a freshman. And all of a sudden he got anointed as a superstar. He's the next guy. He's the next clowny. He's going to be the next number one pick. And in reality, while he's, his production has improved in the last couple of years, he hasn't really improved that much as a pass rusher. He's not really a refined passer. We talked about this before, where he's a guy that doesn't really have pass rush moves. He's winning purely with athleticism. And that wouldn't be a problem if he was a world-class athlete, but that's kind of the thing that's not getting talked about is that when you look at his pro day numbers, he's a good athlete. Don't get me wrong, right? But when you compare him to some of the other edge rushers in this class, as well as some of the edge rushers going back the last decade or more, 
he's not anything special as an athlete. Like you look at a player like Julius Peppers. Julius Peppers was, you know, a guy that did not come into the league, you know, refined or anything like that. But Julius Peppers, when like people ask me, like, who are the greatest athletes you've ever seen? I usually say Michael Vick and Julius Peppers. He was an alien. He was a dude on a different planet that came down to earth to decide to wreck quarterbacks. He was a different athlete. And so you didn't need to be, uh, you know, this really refined pass rusher when you're six foot six, 283 pounds, and you can run a 4'4", 4, 4, 40, or whatever the ridiculous alien things that Julius Peppers could do. But if you're Kayvon Thibodeau and you look at his athleticism, like he's he's not that athletic. I mean, he's a good athlete, right? Don't get me wrong, right? He's But when you look at his athleticism and his metrics from his pro day, his agilities, his jumps or whatever, he's average for a first round edge. Right. And I did this and we talked about this going back to the combine. I tracked, you know, all the first round edges looking at their height, length, weight, their 40 time, their broad jumps, their three cones. I even went back and looked at their short shuttles and whatnot and and, and tracked all these guys. And then you look at Thibodeau and like when you compare him to the average first rounder from the last 12 years, he's average, slightly below average in, in, in some of these categories, like his agilities, like his jumps or whatever the case may be. Now, not too far below average. And again, let's be clear, you know, that still doesn't make it, that's not making him a bad athlete. A first round edge is uh, certainly more athletic than most edge rushers drafted. And certainly edge rushers is one of the more athletic base positions compared to most players on the football field. So he's a good athlete compared to most NFL players. He's a good athlete compared to most edge rushers. But compared to his peers, Compared to the Carl Aftises, the Ojabos, the Jermaine Johnsons, he's not that unique of an athlete. And so I sit here and I go like, we, we the narrative is that, oh, he's this world-class athlete. But then he, is he though? Is he really though? Because you look at the, the pro day numbers and you're just like, like, he didn't hit that three. And then we talked about this before. The three cone, right, is the most predictive of these metrics in terms of NFL success when you look at sack rate among first round edges. And he is three cone, a 7.23. Like the bar for what a good three cone is, is like under 7.2. That when you look at all the more first round edges that have basically averaged like seven, eight or more sacks per 16 games over the last 12 years in their first like four or five years in the NFL, with the exception of Bradley Chubb, like every single one of them had a three cone of like under 7.2. And then Thibodeau was like a 7.23. So like you sit there and you go like, hmm. He kind of, if he's going to be productive, he's going to potentially be an outlier in that regard. And then you sit here and you go like, why didn't he test better? Is it because he's not as good an athlete? Or is there some smoke to this notion that he didn't prep that well? And so then that goes to the whole conversation about, duh, is, you know, is there concerns about like him off field and character and work ethic and all? Again, I can't speak to that. I'm not going to sit here and be too judgmental on that, but I, there's enough there that I'm sitting here going, you, you smell something? Is that smoke? And again, I don't know if there's fire there, but I, I do worry about that. But I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, he's going to be this Vic Beasley bust or whatever the case may be, because again, I don't know about that. But I sit here and I go, my concern with Kayvon Thibodeau, and I'm not sitting here saying the Falcons shouldn't take him at eight. I'm not sitting here saying he's a he's a bust. I think there's a lot more boom bust than you're hearing a lot of people talk about. I don't think enough people are having the conversation that could Kayvon Thibodeau bust, and everybody's just sort of like, no, he's a superstar. He's incredible, and he's being unfairly mistreated by NFL teams and whatnot by assassinating his character and all these various things, and no one's having the conversation that, like, is he as good as people have been hyping him up to be? You know, it's it's a similar conversation that you guys heard me had with Chase Young. It's like he was hyped to be this thing. And like, I don't think Thibodeau is anywhere close to Chase or not. I wouldn't say anywhere close, but Chase Young is better than him. Jalen Phillips, who was the top edge rusher last year, is better than him. Right. Better athlete and a much more technical pass rusher than Thibodeau was coming out. And so I sit here and I go like there is some boom bust to Thibodeau. And my worry if the Falcons were to take him is not because, oh, he's a bust waiting to happen is the hype on him from Falcon fans will be so out of control because of the various narratives, because he's been anointed as a superstar. And like, I, I'm worried about that. That scares me a little bit. You're not going to see the same level of hype if we draft Trayvon Walker or Jermaine Johnson or Call Aftis or Jabba or any of these guys. You will see hype. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to sit here and say like, oh, people would be perfectly rational and reasonable if we draft one of those guys. No, people will hype those guys up. But the level of hype that Thibodeau is going to get if he's an Atlanta Falcon because of all the baggage we have of all these whiffs on first round picks, 
You know, you just go back two years ago when we had those, what, 48 hours where there was rumors that the Falcons were going to trade up in that 2020 draft. And everybody, our Falcon fans were foaming at the mouth over the idea for two days about getting Chase Young. <laughs> you know, they were just foaming at the mouth. And it was just like, ooh, you're going to see similar things if the Falcons take Thibodeau. And that scares me. It scares me that the hype is going to exceed what he is as a prospect and what he is as a player. And again, he could live up to it. He could be that 12 sack guy. He could be the next John Abraham. He could be the next Von Miller. Although again, I, I don't think he's that guy. Um, but if he, you know, if he develops and he refines his, his skill set, he he could be a high end pass rusher in this league. So I'm not trying to write him off. I'm not trying to sit here and say he's a bust waiting to happen. But I sit here and I go, it scares me because I know how Falcon fans are. Right. Again, going back to 2020, people were foaming at the mouth. You know, people were ready to, you know, sell their babies to go and get Chase Young in 2020. And, you know, getting Thibodeau, whew, it's going to be a similar thing. And I, I, that worries me. So I sit here and I go like, I don't wish that on K Kayvon Thibodeau. I do not. Again, I, I don't want him to have those type of expectations coming into the building where people are going to immediately expect them. Similar to what we saw with Vic Beasley. Uh, you know, him to be a 12, so, uh, you know, we're going to have the same conversations in June this year, like we had in June of 2015, where people were like, how many sacks does Vic Beasley get in his rookie season? 10, 12, or 15? Like, you know, there was no conversation that he would only get like four and a half sacks or six sacks or seven sacks or whatever it gets me. It was 10, 12, or 15, right? Which one the over under sacks for Vic Beasley? 12? I'm taking the over. That's how fans were in 2015. And I, I'm afraid that fans will be the same way if we draft Kayvon Thibodeau. And that scares me. So, I hope that answers your question, Ty. Not saying Kayvon Thibodeau is a guaranteed bust or whatever the case may be, but I just I'm that worries me a lot. These expectations that we tend to put on these players and Thibodeau especially would have such enormous expectations. So that's where we're going to leave this conversation, guys. And uh, we'll leave it there. And if you want to send in your questions for future Q&As, uh, you can do so by hitting me up on Twitter at Lockdown Falcons, Facebook at Lockdown Falcons. You can send an email to LockdownFalcons at mail.com, or you can leave a comment here on the Lockdown Falcons YouTube channel. And before we duck out of here, guys, I do want to say rest in peace to Dwayne Haskins, uh, who tragically died at the age of 24 over the weekend. Um, and, you know, I had an uncle that is from that area that knew him growing up and everything I've ever heard about Dwayne Haskins was positives uh, in, in, in terms of the person that he was and, and what he could bring to the football field as well as off the football field. And so it is sad to see such a, a young sort of shining star uh, get sort of snuffed out. And we saw some very prominent media people uh, not necessarily say the most kind things in reaction, the most respectful things in reaction to Dwayne Haskins' death. And, you know, that's just a, a indicator that, you know, people in this media space need to do better, uh, which has certainly been a topic of conversation elsewhere in the world. So that's where I want to say on that. And we'll just sort of leave it at that. And we'll have some future guests and we'll be talking more about the Falcons as this week unfolds. I'm trying to think what is tomorrow's episode going to be? I don't quite know. I think our guest is going to be on Wednesday's episode. So uh, maybe tomorrow is an, another opportunity to do Q&A stuff, or we might have some other stuff for you guys. But uh, appreciate you for tuning in for another episode of Lockdown Falcons. I appreciate you for giving me the time of day, for allowing me to go on another rant about the Falcons taking a wide receiver. <laughs> uh, and hopefully we will never have to talk about it again. Right? Not against taking a wide receiver in rounds two through four. That's You should take that all day. But round one, oof, oh boy. That's... Oof. That's rough. So that will do it for us, guys. Appreciate it. Till then.